So welcome. Welcome to the next Entrepreneurship Speaking Residency. I'm learning how to say that because it's a lot of words. What it basically means is that I'm here um, representing the Toledo Library as essentially entrepreneur in residence. I'm trying to take some of my knowledge, some of my experiences, some of the bumps that I've taken, lumps I guess, and bring those to people who could use that kind of insight. My name is Damon Brown. I am a speaker, obviously. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur twice over. The second startup that I did ended up becoming really popular, ended up selling it, and that all happened while I was the primary caretaker of my first son. He was four months old at the time when I became an entrepreneur. As I say, I was trying to change the world with one hand and trying to change a diaper with the other. Um, and so with that experience, it ended up becoming really formative and understanding people who I call non-traditional entrepreneurs. They're the side hustlers, the, 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 the solopreneurs, the people who have little kids at home who they're the primary caretaker. They have older parents at home who are trying to take care of them. They are people of color. They're people who are part of the LGBTQ community. People who, back in Silicon Valley when I lived there, were not recognized. And now we're getting to a point where there's so many discussions and so many reasons to innovate, so many things that we're kind of facing against, which is always true, right? We always say we're on the precipice of something. We're always on the precipice of something. There's always some new crisis or new challenge. How can we uplift these different voices so that people can all feel like they can participate? My job is to help them as a coach, as a mentor, as a writer, as a speaker, in any way that I can. So I'm a columnist for Inc. Magazine. It's at uh, inkdamonbrown.com. I've done a ton of columns that discuss the stuff I'm going to be talking about tonight. But more importantly, it's an opportunity for us to create a space so that other entrepreneurs can connect together and build something more. And that's my intention, is to create the space. Now, this speaking residency, I believe, is the first one at the Toledo Library. It might be the first one in Toledo. It might be the first one in Ohio. It might be the first one in the United States. We'll just keep going and be very excited. Wait, I see the finger. I see the program in Toronto, so the Toronto library has it. So. Okay, so the first one in America. Okay. All right, got it. So not North America, just America. Thank you. <laughs> and so that makes me very excited. I love new things. I love starting things and beginning things, trying things, and frankly, sometimes failing it. And that's what makes it exciting. I was talking to someone earlier today at another event, and they asked me, as an entrepreneur, how do you learn how to fail? And I said, failing is actually how you learn, right? Because if you're going to create a change in the world, build something different, make something better, make the world better than how you came into it, then how are you going to do that without taking a risk? Most importantly, you do not need to take the risk alone. So if you're trying to make an impact on the world, you do not have to do it alone. I talked about it a little bit in the first discussion. So bringing it all back to the top, we're gonna meet every Wednesday, which is awesome. Never have done this before. And each Wednesday, there will be a different type of discussion. It's how to know. So how do you know that your idea is gonna work? How does it fit? how to show, which is tonight. So once you feel like that your idea fits something, as far as people you want to serve, how do you bring it to the people, right? How to grow, which back on the West Coast, they would call that scaling. So how do you reach even more people? And lastly, how to bring your worth, which is based on my latest book, Bring Your Worth, Level Up Your Creative Power, Value, and Service to the World. And that's how you integrate all these things and become your best self. Because you can have your great idea, you can reach the people that you want to serve. You can reach even more people, even beyond the people you want to serve. But if your life isn't right, it's not going to matter. And so that's what the last discussion is about. We didn't want to bump up against Halloween, so we actually moved it to Tuesday. So that's Tuesday the 29th. Very excited about that one as well. That'll be the grand finale. What we talked about last week, as far as how to know that your idea is going to work, it came down to three basic principles. The first one is to start with the simplest act. Start with the simplest act. 
Starting with the simplest act means do the next best thing to do. If it means spending five dollars in five minutes and buying a web domain for your new idea, then do that. Worst case scenario, you lost five minutes of your life and five dollars. Um, often when we have big ideas, we think about the end of it and not the beginning. So you want to start with the beginning. Also, momentum breeds momentum. And I gave some examples in our previous discussion as far as how companies and individuals were able to move really quickly because we took tiny, tiny steps, bite-sized steps, right? The second thing is to actually complete the idea, complete the act. Sounds really simple, but a lot of people don't complete things. So if you don't complete something, it's not a matter of it being a passive thing where you feel guilt or shame because you didn't finish it. It also psychologically distracts you from actually doing new stuff. So the pile of unfinished things actually is pulling you away from the stuff that you want to do. So that's why it's really important that you complete whatever that is. Lastly, as we talked about last week, it's important to do them practical. Do them practical. I talked about Taylor Swift and how Taylor Swift will fly to a bar mitzvah in Peoria and party with them, even though it probably cost her as far as opportunity costs, maybe $10,000 an hour that she could be doing something else. But the goodwill, the fan base, the representation of her brand, the support she's able to give and get to her community actually elevates things. Few people at her level do that. If we're doing our little startups, if we're doing our little thing, if we're doing things independently, we have the opportunity to curate those experiences for the individual. That's a rare gift. As I mentioned, being practical is often the opposite of connection. Being practical is often the opposite of intimacy. If you think about your cable company and you call them and they put you on hold, and you're listening to hold music and you're pressing all the buttons, that's extremely practical, but it's not connection. And so those are the three things as far as how to know. Once you kind of get some traction with that, then you're able to show it to other people. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. That comes down to also three basic ideas. The first one is understanding you should focus on building the connection versus going for the sale. Building the connection versus going for the sale. Something that salespeople talk about a lot, and there's actually studies about that, is that people will decide if they're going to buy from you or invest in you within the first five seconds. Similar to dating, people often know if they like you or not within the first five seconds. It might be conscious, it might be unconscious. But there's a lot of studies that say this. Why is that? Because they're actually investing in you, not just in whatever you're serving to them. So it's important to know your intention with that. There's something called the Jahari window. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's J-O-H-A-R-I. So it's actually, Sounds like a crazy name, but it's a combination of the two psychologists that came up with it. Kind of like Jodeci, if you're familiar with r and A couple people get the joke, that's great. So it's a combination of the two names. That's why it doesn't make any sense. The Jari window uh, was probably made around the time I was born, so 30, 40 years ago. And it's a window pane. And in this upper, it's called upper corner because I don't want to deal with the theater side of it. This upper corner, are the things that you know about yourself and the thing that, things that other people know about you. For instance, um, I have black hair and it's turning gray. Everyone knows that, I know that. It's clear, right? It's a fact, if you want to call it that. The next pane, right next to it, are the things that you know about yourself but that no one else knows. So it could be that you have this dream of being a ballet dancer, but you shared it with no one. Or something happened to you when you were a kid and you just didn't share it. So it could be deep secrets or it could be something that just never came up. Now, if you're following me, there's the pain down here. That's the interesting one. Those are the things that you don't know about yourself, but other people know about you. That's the most powerful pain, P-A-N-E. Because that represents those things that people pick up from you that you don't even know you're giving off. And lastly, there's a corner right here, which represents the things that you don't know about yourself and no one else knows, 
you know, there's not a lot of relevance there because no one knows what's in that box. This, this though, the, the lower corner one, this is the powerful one. I talk about it in Bring Your Worth where we tend to underestimate what other people are picking up on. We tend to underestimate other people. We think we can come in this way and get this from them. I don't believe that. I believe in, a, in a, the intuition and the insight of other people will pick up on what your intention is. That's kind of the second part of it, is understanding why you're actually trying to serve these people. I was coaching someone recently, and they were talking about they wanted to go to an event and sell out of their item, which is cool. We all want to do that, I guess, right? Love to like sell all these items. Like, that's a great intention. That's good business. Hopefully I'm serving people, et cetera. So that was their intention, which is cool. I have that intention too. But that's kind of where it stopped. And so I said, okay, so we could say, yes, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna sell out this product. Or we could say, I'm gonna go there and I'm going to serve the people in this particular way because they've been underserved and I wanna make sure that they're taken care of. My way of taking care of them is with this product, but if another way comes up, then I shall do so. And it might be that people are interested in the product, but they're not ready for it. Maybe they can't afford it. Maybe there's a tweak I need to do to the product. So maybe I won't sell all the product this time, but I will take that information and I'll listen to everything that they say. And based on what they say, then I'll be able to serve them correctly. Maybe with a different product, maybe with something completely different. That's different. If your intention is to get the quick sale, then it's gonna change everything. It's gonna change the words that you hear. It's gonna change the words and actions, physical and otherwise, that you do. It's going to be you meeting someone at an event and they're not interested in buying your product or service, but they know literally a million other people that will do so. But if you're listening to them and just waiting for them to pull out their checkbook, you're gonna miss that. One of my favorite early social media theories from a few years back, I might have mentioned in one of my books early on, is that it doesn't matter how many followers you have on social media. It's the same discussion. Because you could have one follower, but if that follower is an Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey, and they're retweeting your stuff, or they're sharing it, or they're liking it, that's way more powerful than a million people that are following you that aren't doing anything. Same thing. And so if you're focused not on the long-term relationship, but just on the sale, there's gonna be huge opportunities that you will miss every single time. Lastly, in regards to building those relationships, again, you are, they are actually investing in you. And when I say investing, I wanna be really careful with that. That's why I'm kind of pausing. There's a few different resources that people can invest in. Something I've been thinking about a lot. People can give you money, and that tends to be a shorthand, horribly so, of value. But y'all are giving me intention right now, and focus. That's worth something too. You're giving me time, right? People can give you that. So it's not a matter of someone, again, immediately buying your product or service, them just giving you the time, them focusing on you for a moment so you can do your pitch or have that discussion. That's valuable too. Even if they don't buy your product, they're giving you something. So that's an important distinction. If people are involved with you in any, any way, it's gonna be because of how you are, not because of exactly what your service is. When my wife and I got married several years ago, she had one big request. She wanted a pair of Jimmy Choo shoes so she could wear them at the reception. That was her request. I'm not a clothes horse, you can tell. That's not my thing. But it's her thing. The question is why? Now we, we got the shoes, like that happened. Yeah, I wanted to be happy with that. But those shoes cost 10 times easily as much as us going to Payless or DSW, right? The question is why? Well, it represented a certain echelon in saying, you know what, we're not always fancy, but we're fancy tonight. Oh yeah, we're gonna really celebrate tonight. We're pulling out all the stops. And look at the shoes, they represent that. I have about 24 Apple products 
in my house, across my family. I'm the tech guy for the family. They're all Apple products, right, from the iPod minis from when my wife and I first started dating several years ago to the iPad that my boys occasionally borrow from me. By borrow, I mean take. I don't get it back. So the thing is, is that I know enough about technology. I know, and I watch my money. I know that my beautiful, I don't think it's out right now, but my beautiful Mac Air book, which I absolutely adore, I can get a PC for like a fourth of that price. And I have connections. I can probably get it for a fifth of that price. So why? You kind of see where things are going then, right? The last time I was in Paris, I was broke, like really broke. And a good friend of mine, Jeanette Hurt, who writes about food, she's a specialist at it, told me that I had to try a place called Le Souffle, which is known for their souffles. I landed at a Charles de Gaulle, I think that's the airport, landed there, took the train in, took a taxi, didn't even go to my place, and went directly to La Souffle. Took the little bit of money I had, gave it to the waiter, and it's like, do you want like, you know, uh, sparkling water and all that? I was like, no, 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 just, just the Grand Marnier Souffle. They made it in front of me. Amazing, amazing. A few years later, I'm living in San Diego, and there's a place up the street called the Meshuga Shack. It's Yiddish, so forgive me for butchering it, but Meshuga Shack. It's down the street. I could walk up there. Best cafe lattes in the world for me. I've done my traveling. I've done the research. They're really good. The question is, is that really the best souffle in the world? Is that really an amazing shoe? Is it really the best products? Is that the best cafe latte in the world? Probably not. But when I went in there with my equivalent of $10 to Le Souffle, they treated me like a king. And I'm sure I was jet lagged, smelly, after flying for 14 hours or whatever. Same thing with Meshuga Shack. They actually know my kids. Remember, they were in walking distance of my house, so when my two kids were born, I'd be, you know, dad, saggy eyes, up all night, pushing Alec, and then later on Avi, my youngest son, pushing them over there. And the owner, who I got to know, was telling me, you know, talking to me, and talking to him, talking to them. I knew why he would make them a sugar shack. He became not quite a friend, but someone who was invested in me. So I invested in him. Those cafe lattes cost twice as much, easily. They're like seven, eight dollars. Take my money. So what am I really investing in? I'm investing in that relationship. So I give all those desperate details because all those examples represent us being willing to pay more. And whether it's paying more time, more energy, walking a little bit further to go to a particular place, flying across the, across the world, and then going straight to, to a thing when you barely have any money. Because I'm investing in that relationship because they invested in me. That's the kind of energy that you want to have, not the quick sale. So number one, if you're going to, to show, you have to invest in the relationship, not the quick sale. Hopefully that makes it clear. The second thing is that, this is really important, there is no competition if you're being real. There is no competition if you're being real. That word gets trotted around a lot since Jennifer Lopez and all these other things, but there's a, a genuineness to that. That's why I'm using the word real. My mom and my stepfather, the dad who raised me, are both from Camden, New Jersey. Have any of y'all heard of Camden? Okay, gotcha. I see the somber face, okay. <laughs> so Camden, for those that don't know, Camden is like um, Compton, like Flint, I went to school in Detroit, so I know Flint well. It's on the other side of the state. Um, Flint, um, Inglewood, East Oakland, etc. cetera. Um, probably the landscape of a lot of movies that came out in the early 90s about that culture. Except this was in their era, because obviously my parents are older than me. Canon was so bad that when I took a sociology class, Sociology 101, up at Oakland University in Detroit, 
I opened up my textbook and Camden was in there as a case study of a messed up city. I swear. So I <laughs> can't, can't keep a straight face. So I was somewhere between crying and laughing and trying not to get the attention of my professor who I was intimidated by. I'm like, I, I gotta keep it together. But that's how rough Camden is. Not saying it's rougher than other cities, but it literally is a textbook example. That's where my parents come from. The reason why I know this, and I know some of this history, is because they told me what they learned. They learned to have a vision when other people didn't hold that vision for you, right? Not exactly support. Um, they learned to be resilient in the face of danger in some cases, literally dodging bullets, right? Lastly, they learned to do the most with the resources that they have. Both my parents grew up poor slash working class, depending on the year. So when they had me and raised me, what do you think they taught me? They taught me to keep a vision when other people don't understand. Right? They taught me to be resilient against adversity because not everyone's going to be in the corner, the market or otherwise. And lastly, to maximize the resources that you have. What does that sound like? That sounds like changing the world. That sounds like entrepreneurship. But they wouldn't be able to pass that on to me if they had guilt and or shame related to their history. I would have lost that knowledge. Like how much knowledge have we lost or are we losing right now because there's a pool of shame and or guilt around our histories? What's not being passed on? When I went through my own experience with entrepreneurship and that was my challenging time, it was me, as I said, learning to be a dad for the first time and taking it very seriously, as you can probably tell, you know, my kids in my world. So wanting to do a good job as a dad. At the same time, doing the startup. And then doing the startup again. And then the startup had success, which it meant it took even more time and more energy and more organization to get things going and to keep things going. We're on the cover of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And I still got a one-year-old. Like, how are we supposed to do this? And I'm waking up at 3.15 a.m. Working, waking up and doing that from 3.15 to 6 a.m. with my startup. And then from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. it's just myself and my first son. And that's my life. Until it felt like forever. And juggling the potential burn, forget potential burnout, being on the verge of burnout, being one of the few stay-at-home dads that I knew. All those different challenges. When I sold the company in 2015, the day that it was sold was the first day that I started doing my ink column. It's at inkdamonbrown.com. And it was about that struggle. And then I kept writing at least once a week. Kept writing, kept writing. And that became the Bite Size Entrepreneur, which became a bestseller. And that brings me here to you. But the potential burnout, the struggle, um, the times when I thought I wasn't going to make it, I had to accept that as part of my history first before I could share any knowledge with you. Whether it's valuable or not, that alchemical process of that, transforming those challenges into something to give to the world, that's changed me. But even me wanting to make an impact in the world could not have happened unless I was willing to be real. If I wasn't willing to be real, then we wouldn't be talking right now. If my parents weren't willing to be real and say, hey, yeah, we're from Camden, it's some jacked up neighborhoods there, but your grandmother's from there too, let's go visit, here are the challenges here, here are your cousins, here's your life, this is your heritage. If they didn't have pride in that, then I wouldn't have gotten that insight either. The entrepreneur Paul Jarvis, he's a fascinating guy. He has a book called The Company of One, or A Company of One, and it's about solopreneurs, so right up my alley. 
there's some really good gems in there. One of the things that he says is, your way of thinking should be viewed as a commodity. Your way of thinking should be viewed as a commodity. In other words, your POV is what actually people are buying. And when I say buying, again, I'm not talking about in a capitalistic way. I mean, when people are focused on you, when people give you energy, when people give you time, when people give you money. Your POV is your commodity, not the thing that you're selling, not the thing that you're doing. It's you. It always comes back to you. So when it comes to being real, and I wish I had another term for it. Maybe y'all can help me out with it. But when it comes to being real, there's a few ways that you can actually go a little bit deeper. The first one is to understand that analog is preferable to digital. It sounds super, super obvious, but we really have to think about this. For instance, I live in Las Vegas now. I used to live in Sylvania. I flew all the way here to spend time with y'all. Or I could be back home in my nice little home office in my favorite chair. They could beam me in. And I can give the exact same information. I can even use my hands, <laughs> like I do a lot. Do all that, have Q&A, have a good conversation. I'd be like, all right, thank you. Y'all have been real, thank you. And then click the computer off, put on my favorite slippers, and then go get in bed with my wife and two kids and sleep well. That's not the same, right? That's not as real. You know, when you see me gestating and jumping around the stage and using my voice here and there and all that, that represents a different experience. You're able to understand me on a different level. So physically connecting with people, again, that's part of my two apps that I created. So physically connecting with people, that's like, you look at it as kind of like a morphed version of, of um, Maslow's hierarchy, where that's like at the top. Like you're gonna, you're gonna, your chance of connecting with people and frankly of building a connection and actually getting a sale is much higher. And then of course as you go down, then it's like, well maybe you do a video conference, you know, Skype or FaceTime or whatever. And then less preferable is a phone call. And then less preferable is a personalized email. And then a text. You see where I'm going. I could probably go on forever. The least intimate, perhaps, is social media. And I have nothing against social media. It's just you're kind of fire hosing all the people that follow you. That's the opposite of intimacy. So I have a tough time when people say that social media creates intimacy where I don't think it does. Or maybe they just have a different version of intimacy than I do. So analog, always preferable to digital. As I talked about in our previous discussion, I would go down to downtown Sylvania and have coffee with people, and that's how I end up getting insight as far as how I can serve them the best, as opposed to just shooting them an email. Way more time consuming, not practical, but it mattered. And there was a difference as far as how I served everyone. The second thing, as far as with you understanding there is no competition when you're being real, is to understand that no one's going to be, if you found your thing, no one is going to be as into it as you are. And it's going to have your mark on it, whether you realize it or not. This is some audience particip participation. I can't even say the word. How many of y'all use like the ride share sharing services like Uber and Lyft and so forth? Yeah, raise a hand, great. Um, how many of you prefer uh, Uber and don't want to do Lyft? <laughs> And how many of you are into Lyft? No? OK, gotcha. <laughs> it's like kind of, kind of a difference, but sort of not. So it sounds like there's slight preferences there, but not really deep. Depending on people you talk to, it's like McDonald's versus Burger King. It's, um, I don't know, um, Wendy's versus Charles Jr. I don't know. I just keep going. I digress. What those two represent, though, are two very different cultures. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get feedback as far as if y'all had a, a leaning towards one or the other. When I first heard about Uber, I was living in San Francisco, and it was a friend of mine. We drank quite a bit. And so we're going to head back home. And he says, wait, hold on. Instead of walking home, why don't I call an Uber black car? And this is back when Uber was just a German word. So I was like, what'd you say? 
again, I had a couple of drinks. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, it's an Uber black car. So I can't remember if it was a website or an app. It was that early. It's, again, 2008. And he says, well, you, you go on this website or you go on this app and you click this thing and then a black car, like a personal driver will come and get you. And then you get in the car and then he'll, he or she will drop you off somewhere and then it's paid for like through your checking account. And I was like, what kind of magic is this? This is weird. <laughs> Again, 2008. Um, so he called one, and I was super suspicious. I'm sure, again, because I had a drink, I was probably more willing to get in a stranger's car. Got in the black car, minimal conversation. A few minutes later, we get dropped off. I was safe. And I was like, that was weird. It's like, yeah, that was cool. I'm like, no, that was weird. That was beginning at Uber. <laughs> A few years ago, I actually saw Travis Kalanick, who's the founder or co-founder of Uber, definitely the face of Uber until recently, speak at TED. He has an intimidating presence. He's also the quintessential New Yorker. So forgive me for any New Yorkers, but I can't remember if it's the Upper East Side or West Side that tends to have a lot of money. I want to say the West Side. And he was basically like, we want to be like someone on the Upper West Side who says, yeah, I'll get you home. Let me call my driver. Let me call a black car for you. My driver will come by. But doing it for middle class, middle class wallets, right? expensive pace, a little bit of money, that kind of thing. That was his intention. That was his intention. Seeing him in person, he represents that. Lyft was actually founded by two, maybe three, but I believe it was two college students. And it was, if you've ever lived on a college campus and not had a car, that's me. I lived like that for four years on a college campus. It's hard, especially when I was in, in Michigan. I was in Detroit, but I was in the suburbs, and you had to walk like two miles to get groceries. I love to cook. You see the conflict. So they set up a ride sharing service, and it's like, hey, so so-and-so, James is going that way. Why don't you hop in the car with him and then give him some gas money? That's how it began. It began as a collegiate sharing service of cars. That's how it began. If you were an early user of Lyft, as I was, then you'd see these pink mustaches. Yeah, right? Pink mustache is about the, the width of, of my arm, so about six feet, five and a half feet. And they stick these hairy, furry pink mustaches on the grill of all the contractors that were driving around. You could see a lift coming down the street. That was their vibe. Does that sound like a black car? Does that sound, does that sound like the Upper West Side? But it sounds like John, and I'm forgetting his last name, that sounds like the founder, who I also saw speak. So if someone gave me, because they're worth, both worth several billion dollars now. So if someone gave me like a billion dollars, and they're like, Damon, start a car, car service. I thought about this. I would start a car service where when they got to where you are, there would be food that you ordered, and then you can actually eat while you're in the service. Doesn't that sound cool? But that's me. I like to eat. Do you understand? No one can duplicate that. They probably haven't even come up with that. But that's the way my mind thinks. So again, there is no competition. I can start a car service. It can do well, it might not do well, but there's no competition for me because I'm going to come up with my own kooky idea. That's such an important element of it. Perhaps the most important element as far as competing is to understand that you're not going to be for everyone. Your job is not to serve everyone. Your job is not to serve everyone. Your job is to serve the people that you're supposed to serve. That might mean turning people away. That might mean that people say no to you. And that's actually an indicator of you going in the right direction. When my family and I moved to Las Vegas, one of the first things we do, actually, actually we cross country drove over there. On the way there, let me be very specific. On the way there, we were on Yelp, looking up the, um, the restaurants in Las Vegas area. Because Las Vegas is fairly big. We were trying to find the spiciest restaurants. My origins are in the South, 
couple generations back, but it must have skipped some generations because I'm, ins I'm into insanely spicy food. My wife is originally from India, so she's Hindi. When we go to a Thai restaurant, I'm getting a 9 out of 10. She's getting a 10 out of 10. Our kids are getting a 5 out of 10. They're 6 and 3. That's my family. All right? That's, but, but that's my point. That's not for everybody. That sounds insane to some people. I'm salivating now. I'm like, I can't wait to get back home. We have a favorite Thai place, right? It's like, I can't wait to get back home and get some of that Pad Thai. I did level nine next time. I'm going to do level 10. <laughs> Seriously, I'm no jokes here. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating. Like, I'm ready for that right now. The point is, is that you can go on Yelp and say, what's the spiciest food in Las Vegas? And they'll give it to you. Certain people, they'll be like, no. You go so see something on the strip, and it'll say, habanero burgers, it'll make you cry, stay away. And my family, including my little kids, are getting excited. <laughs> but everyone else is scared. But that's my point. That habanero burger place, which they do exist, but that habanero burger place is not for everyone. But it's for me. That's what you want to create. I discovered this when I started coaching, and I just started coaching a handful of years ago. And I realized that me wanting to have a specialized, in co specialized coach practice was actually an asset, not a liability. For instance, if I came in here and I said, hey, I'm a coach, I will coach everybody in this room. I will coach men, women, non-binary, I will coach black people, Mexican people, white people. I will coach the old, the young, whatever. I will coach Little League. I will coach anyone in this room. <laughs> you bring people in here, I will coach them. I'll coach you, right? How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel special? <laughs> does that make me sound desperate? <laughs> Probably a little bit of both, right? It's like, that's not specialized. Why are you picking me? Because I'm here, because I'm breathing, I have a pulse as opposed to what I do, where it's, I focus on non-traditional entrepreneurs, the side hustlers, the solopreneurs, the people who might feel discounted or have not been heard from. Because I figured that at this period of time, we have the manpower and woman power, we have the tools, we have the devices to actually create the world that we actually were supposed to create in the first place. So I'm gonna be part of that movement. So then when I'm talking to people about my coaching, they're like, they're either like, I don't know what you're talking about, and it's not for them. Or people are like, yes, let's do it. That's the difference. But it requires people saying no. And that's me being real. I don't have any interest in other type of coaching. I just don't. But if I push that agenda back to the Jahari window, I think real recognizes real. And I'd be like, yeah, I'll coach you. And people will be like, well, you don't seem that enthusiastic, though. Right? You said you coach me, but you don't seem that into it. And the tips you're talking about don't really apply to me. Well, that would be because I wasn't really into it. There's people that have actually said, no, I won't coach you. Because I knew that once we got to that first session, they would realize that I wasn't the coach for them. It wasn't like I was a millionaire but I also want it to be true. And so the people that are in that fold that I do coach, or the people I do speak to, they are the people that I'm supposed to connect with. It's no use in having something false in that. Again, if you believe that truth always comes out, then that keeps you honest from the beginning. So number one, when it comes to how to show, you really want to focus on the long-term relationship versus the quick sale. Number two, you really want to focus on being real, because when you're being real, you have no competition. Lastly, number three, you want to be ready so you don't have to get ready. Something that, probably from the Camden streets, I heard it somehow, people say it a lot. But if you are ready, then you don't have to get ready. And there's something great about that. The number one thing when it comes to that is understanding that 
your foundation is your gold. So the time, um, Malcolm Gladwell talked about the 10,000 hours in uh, Outliers. That's been debunked a bit, but the theory still holds true. Those bits and pieces that you do over time, they matter. Even if there's bits and pieces that you don't think fit into the whole thing, they do matter. I was doing another uh, talk earlier today, and they're asking me about a part of my life that I didn't really get paid a lot for. And I told them that I have DJ. And one of the things that I learned from DJing is being able to read a crowd. If the rhythm changes, or if the crowd isn't really dancing, then you need to change to something else. Where else does that apply? It applies to public speaking. Being able to understand people, being able to read people, being able to read a room, knowing when to stop the record and when to continue. That's part of my foundation. That's part of my life. And that integrates into the work that I do now. And that's part of being ready, is integrating, or at least trying to integrate, all these different pieces. I know when I first started doing the, the ink column, again, it was happened to run the day that our startup, startup was sold, because I did it with two of the co-founders. So it was July 31st, 2015. Talking about my experience. And then I would do one once a week. Now it's about 500, maybe 500 plus, of like these 300, 400, 500, 600 word stories. Week after week, sometimes a couple a day four and a half years. And so when someone comes and says, what do you mean by non-traditional entrepreneur? How do you know what you're doing as a coach? What are these ideas that you're exploring? Are you sure there's some depth to them? I could say, yeah, whatever you want to read, there's, what is that? 30,000 words, 40,000 words? Just right there, it's all free, check it out. Enjoy yourself. And not even from a a boastful standpoint where I have 500 done, but more like that has the social proof of me exploring these things and representing this particular thing. It also proves to me and shows me in a direct way all the work that I've done to understand this. But that was day by day, bit by bit. The column was happening while I still had my, my two-year-old then, and then we had another kid, and the whole thing started over again. The column still continued. The foundation is gold, but you can't make a quick foundation. On that note, trending topics, which is a term that they use in, you know, for Twitter, as far as what's, what's hot at the moment, you can't really build a career or build a connection based on that. Just, it's just not possible. Back when I was in Silicon Valley, I've been thinking about that period of time a lot lately, and I was about 10, 15 years ago now, 2008. The most popular commercial that I was hearing about was the Carl's Jr. commercial with the models. I don't know if any of y'all remember that at all. Carl's Jr., which is the, the fast food chain known for their burgers, they had these commercials with the stereotypical American blonde thin models in bikinis. And they were eating these three, four patty, maybe mm -hmm. six to eight strips of bacon burgers with barbecue sauce on them. You can look it up online if you want to. <laughs> and the juice would be spilling over them and then they'd have napkins, but there wouldn't be enough napkins. I'll, I'll spare you the details. I actually got banned in some areas, including some places in the South. It wasn't explicit, but it was implied. Those commercials worked. People were lining up for these burgers. There were a lot of articles about it. People called it like the heart attack burger. Right? It's like twice or three times your daily, daily allotted of calories for like an adult male. Like, it's probably like 5,000 calories or something. Not exaggerating. Their stock, as far as for their parent company, which I get the name of it right now, it went up higher. It's similar to uh, the Popeye's chicken sandwich, which happened like two months ago, which if y'all are on social media, you probably heard too much about it. Same thing. Same thing with the Double Down sandwich a few years ago with KFC. I think it was called Double Down. Now, what's the big topic in regards 
to burgers. Nine burgers. So now it's an impossible burger. Now it's beyond me. These things are literally made out of plants. I went to Ted early this year and tried some. It was hard to tell the difference. But they're literally made out of plants. Ten years ago, it was all about killing as many cows as possible and getting as many pigs as possible and just putting it all into one big burger. Now suddenly, people are like doing vegan or semi-vegan, I guess if you don't put cheese on it, right? So my question is, what if you had your little heart attack diner, which there is a heart attack diner in Arizona, but if you had this little heart attack diner where you specialize in these three, four, even five patty burgers with all the fixings on there, and that was the basis of your business, not because you really want to give people heart attacks, but because you thought this was the hot thing at the time in 2008, 2009. Suddenly, within a year, this past year, these veggie burgers, which is what I call them, are the thing. Like, one of the companies went public, like, that, on that level. They're worth, like, billions, billions. They've covered in ink, which is one of the, you know, the magazine I have a column with, on that level. So what are you going to do? Right? You did it based on the trend, and the trend changed. You're going to go and say, oh, okay, well, this was, this was a heart attack joint. Now it's um, the lotus joint. <laughs> you know? And now we'll have, like, lettuce. And in the lettuce, there will be a Beyond Meat burger. But no cheese. This is the vibe. And we'll have kombucha in the back. You're going to switch it up? What does that do? It does a couple of things, as you can imagine. Number one, it erodes the public trust. Because if you're here, there, here, here right now, and then you switched it up, then why should I continue to, to give you my time, my attention, my money, my focus, right? If um, the Meshuga Shack suddenly started selling milkshakes instead of coffee, I'd be really confused. If Jimmy Choo suddenly started doing affordable shoes, right, and they are available at Payless, then I don't think they'd be as, as glamorous. So instead, you need to focus on that thing that you know you're going to be in for, frankly, the long haul. The best way to determine what that is, is goes back to the first step, is being real. If you're real about it, then it's easy. Me talking to y'all about this, it's hard work. I work very hard. But this is easy, because it comes from me. This is the real me. There's, there's no filter here. Like, this is me. This is me talking. If we got a drink afterwards, I'd be talking the same way. Makes it a lot easier to make an impact. One of the biggest things that I learned as far as understanding the trending topic versus something being sustainable is actually someone from my childhood who just came back into my life. And that's uh, Andrew Dice Clay. Back in the 80s, I just saw her face as not. People of a certain age, I'm late Gen X, early Gen Y, people of a certain age remember I entered this play really well. It was him, it was Madonna, it was Prince, mostly music stars at the time. But Andrew Dice Clay was on that same plateau. He was a guy, leather jacket, dirty nursery rhymes, constantly smoking, around the time when people were saying smoking will kill you. So a definite rebel, and told racist and extremely sexist jokes, like extremely sexist jokes. Very much a product of the 80s. Early 90s came, and we have Ellen, and a lot of those discussions as far as with gay equality. You have things from my culture as far as with the gang and blank, black on black violence, equal opportunity for African Americans. And so you have that. So suddenly, He's not getting booked. Those million dollar shows he was doing, suddenly, he seemed to be out really quickly. So I wonder if you know where I'm going. I get to Vegas. He has a residency on the Strip. One of the hotels. I'm not a fan of his, so I'm not following him like that. But I did notice. So who's coming to his shows? It might be the same people from the 80s who have grown up and still like Andrew Dice Clay. But it's also him bringing in new people. Now again, I'm not a fan of his, but 
but I have to respect him because he didn't change. He's still representing what he considers to be real. I'm in that category of no, but you got to respect that. And real recognizes real. I see it. I'm like, that seems to be who he is. And his audience, for whatever level, represents that too. So trending topics aren't really what you want to go after. And lastly, when it comes to, uh, to really getting ready, so you don't have to, to hurry up and get ready, however you want to put that, the best way to actually create a future for yourself is to make it yourself. In other words, being passive about it and reacting to what's hot now is not going to get you to where you want to be. Um, financially, as far as getting attention, as far as focus being on you, all those resources that we were talking about. One of my favorite quotes, which I usually butcher, so forgive me, is from uh, Wayne Gretzky about two decades ago, back when he was really hot. Actually, he was really hot about three decades ago, around that same era. But about two decades ago, a sports reporter asked him how he's so good. And he says, I don't worry about where the puck is, I worry about where the puck is going. And that's where my focus is. I don't worry about where the puck is, I worry about where the puck is going. In other words, if you start to build and realize that there are people to serve that are not being served right now, it gives you the unique opportunity to find them and build that commitment, that trust. Um, Seth Godin calls it the permission model, where you coming to, to me to hear me speak, that's you giving permission for me to speak. If y'all didn't show up, I wouldn't have permission, right? As opposed to me saying, you're going to listen to me speak. It's a push versus pull model. If you actually are able to create that wave, even in the smallest of ways, like with my little ink column, starting at four and a half years ago, smallest little waves, then those waves start to crest. And they start to get bigger and bigger. And by the time there's an opportunity for you to take full advantage of that, then you're going to be the one that's there. The point is, is to actually have faith in your vision before other people support it. Just like I'm talking about with my folks from Camden. They were both the first generations to go to college. Think about that. My parents aren't that old. But they had to have that vision before other people understood it, even understood the value of college. The work I'm doing now, again, I've had the college for four and a half years. People weren't messing with the non-traditional entrepreneurs four and a half years ago. But I knew better. I was one of them, and I could see it coming with the stuff that was going on culturally, with the technology and the tools that were happening. It's not to brag on me. It's just you have to start moving before you get the outside validation. And that's actually the best way to sell. Because if you make that connection, and you have that, that, that internal fortitude, and you're moving forward, like I talked about in the first session, where you're building that momentum, then people will recognize it. A friend of mine named Noah for Merchant, I think I mentioned her last week, she calls it signaling. So the more that you represent yourself, the more other people will recognize what you represent. And then they'll come to you, or you'll create a tribe around them. That tribe could be people that purchase your products, your services. It could be people that support you, like we talked about last week. It could be people that just want to see you shine. But it has to start with you. It doesn't go the other way around. So as far as how to show, you really want to make sure that you focus on the long-term relationship versus going for the quick sale. People recognize that. At least that's my belief. I found that to be true over and over again with everything that I do. Number two, there is no competition if you're being real. You know, so I get the Oscar Wilde quote. Um, you don't want to, um, you can't be anyone. You should be yourself because everyone else is taken, right? <laughs> It's a brilliant quote, and it's true. You build your business on that, whatever you're doing. And even if you're getting a little bit of money here and there, you are building a business. You are creating something. So many of us do these things and then don't realize that we're small business owners or medium business owners, and we're just doing stuff. No, you're not doing stuff. No, 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 you're, you're building a business. Treat it as such. Right? And you're building a business that only you can create. I don't care if you're serving ice cream. 
It's going to be your ice cream. And lastly, understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, lastly, understanding that you have the opportunity to create things and do things before you think you're actually ready. And that's how you're able to be ready before you have to get ready. And those are my thoughts. Thank you.